I mean, four years ago, we, we talked about the elections as being America's Brexit moment. And, you know, for a lot of reasons, it was not supposed to happen. It was unthinkable from the perspective of the strategists. The ruling class didn't want it to happen. And it, and sure enough, it was a, a boulder of instability in the political landscape for the next four years. And there's nothing they could really do about it. Well, here we are at the other end of it. You know, we have three days officially left of the Trump administration. And it's been an interesting four years. The, the uh, inauguration is gonna take place on Wednesday amid scenes of, you know, a, a besieged capital with 20, 25,000 National Guard troops, um, you know, stationed on every corner. Um, it's really, you know, I, I think one of the, the telling conversations that sums it up recently, we had a, a discussion on the editorial board about the need to stop using the word unprecedented because we, out of concern that we were going to overuse it and it was going to lose its meaning. That's the word that comes to mind with every recent event. Um, you know, there's a lot of parallels to the Civil War era and people talking about how Abraham Lincoln in 1861 had to be sort of uh, rushed into the Capitol building secretly um, because of threats of, of assassination plots and, and this kind of thing. So, you know, I, yeah, after 2020, I think a lot of comrades, a lot of people feel like they've seen it all. And within one week of the new year, this was kind of a confirmation that this process is going to continue. You know, it's like 20, 2021, Welcome to the new year. Are you ready for more? And that's kind of the uh, the, the way that this is un unfolded. Uh, we weren't particularly surprised by what's happening, by, by what we saw at the Capitol. But all the same, even if it's a confirmation of the a process that we've been following, it uh, it's still you know there there have been moments where you pause and it's quite surreal to see these headlines of you know all the media talking about an insurrection, Trump's insurrection, or you know just the 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 scenes of all of this, a violent breach of the Capitol has never happened before. Um, no less during a joint session of Congress where you have basically the entire legislative branch in person in the building. There's, you know, almost all 535 members of, of the, the Senate and the, the House of Representatives were, were there. And this is going to be the second impeachment that's now underway for, for Trump. The first time a president has been impeached twice. Um, so, and that's happened four times in history. So Trump owns half of the impeachments in, in US history. But last time, it, it, the last one took place about a year ago and it took months, you know, it, they had to gather dozens, I don't know, hundreds of, of witnesses. It took about three months to gather all the evidence. This time, all the witnesses were there in the building. I mean, it's the, it's the, uh, the members of Congress themselves who were screaming and hiding, um, crawling on their bellies and ripping off their Senate pins. And, you know, the yeah, tear gas in, in the Capitol Rotunda while armed militiamen are, are roaming the halls with zip ties ready to take hostages. I mean, it was really quite incredible um, scenes. These people were chanting, hang Mike Pence, uh, where's Nancy Pelosi? So it was yet another moment where millions of people were glued to their screens in disbelief um and it's it's hard to top this stuff on uh you know even in fiction I, you know in, i don't think there's anything in in house of cards that was as interesting as as the things that are actually playing out in, in reality um it was it was striking how little police presence there was at the capitol a lot of people made the comparison of the law enforcement response during the black lives matter movement in in june compared to what everyone could plainly see was a very different scene um, this time. Back in the, in the George Floyd protest in the summer, the defense secretary at the time said, we need total domination of the battlefield um, and talked about you know, setting up National Guard troops on every corner. There was tear gas, 14,000 people were arrested, um, countless scenes of, of police brutality. And this time, of course, you know, people watch the footage of Capitol Hill cops basically letting the protesters through the barricades, in some cases, you know, almost guiding them through the halls of Congress. It looked like they were just backing up or giving directions, allowing them to take selfies with them. Um, and of course, there were some scenes where you saw Capitol Police resisting, but completely outnumbered, um, distressed, completely overtaken. And so, you know, you have 
uh, over a dozen of these Capitol Police officers under investigation um, to, to see whether they you know, did something to help the, the mob. But the point is that the whole world saw how vulnerable the, the US government is and it made the state look so weak and fragile. And um, you know, once the, the National Guard troops were called in, Congress reconvened. It's reported that it was Pence who called in the troops and not Trump, um, which is of interest. Um, and of course, everyone saw Trump's video re response calling for calm, but also mixing it with praise for the protesters saying that we love you and you're special. And, you know, a few days later, he denounced it all and, you know, suggested that it was Antifa who had actually broken into the, the Capitol, which is laughable. But the fact that that conspiracy theory has gained such huge traction in a very short space of time, I think is also indicative of how much confusion and, and division there is among Trump's base caused by, by these events. Um, roughly half of, of, of his base supported storming the Capitol and saw this as like, this is our people, this is our revolution. Um, the other half is very much against it. And many of those people are the ones blaming Antifa for it. Um, there is also a significant segment of the Trump base that does blame Trump for it and sees this as, as having gone too far. Um, but in any case, I think it is clear that he, he didn't expect things to get out of hand um, to this extent and, and that he played overplayed his hand um, and got burnt playing with with fire, you know, the, this game that he had been kind of pursuing. Um, but late into the night, they they finally did reconvene uh, up into the next morning. They ended up certifying Biden's election with uh, blood and blo broken glass on the floor and a homicide investigation taking place right outside the, the Senate chamber. So it really topped off what was already um, a very unusual election. Uh, we were already planning to draft an article about January 6th before any of the storming of the Capitol events, um, just because there were so many uh, members of Congress that were playing into this stop the steal rhetoric and you know, supporting Trump's conspiracy that, that there had been massive fraud. And in the end, over half of the Republicans in Congress ended up opposing the election certification. That's normally a formality. You know, there's, there's never been um, this kind of a, a, of a split or, a, or a, a dispute. And of course, in each of these swing states that Trump is, is disputing, um, and it, it's quite remarkable how, how that conspiracy has spread to, to a majority of the Republican lawmakers. It was 147 congressional Republicans who ended up uh, voting to oppose the, the election certification the Stop the Steal campaign has raised hundreds of millions of dollars since November 3rd. Um, so that in itself already represented a, a crisis of, of the legitimacy for, for, the, this, for the state um, and for its institutions. Mitch McConnell is a senator from Kentucky. He's the, the Senate majority leader, has been up until now seen as the, you know, one of the most important powerful men in Congress, has so far avoided uh, a, a, an open confrontation with Trump, but that changed on January 6th uh, before the storming of the Capitol. He, you know, he said that in his 36 years in the Senate, this is the most important vote of his life to certify the elections and to prevent the, the election result from being overturned. And in, in his speech, you know, it also gives you a flavor of how serious, um, how seriously they were taking this, this threat. He said that overturning the election would damage our republic forever. He says that um, our democracy would enter a death spiral. We'd never see the whole nation except an election again. Every four years, there'd be a, a scramble for power at any cost. Uh, the electoral college would cease to exist. I mean, that's that's basically the, the, the terms that he was using um, to describe this. And of course, January 6th was also the culmination of all of the, you know, I mean, hundreds of lawsuits that the, the, the Trump camp was pushing through courts um, across the country at all levels. None of them went anywhere. There was no legal basis found for any of the claims of, of fraud. And so it was largely treated as a publicity stunt, um, but a very dangerous one that was making all the strategists very worried because the result is that tens of millions of people were becoming convinced that this, this election was fraudulent. And the kind of the, the gap between the two parallel versions of reality started to really grow um, quite incredibly to where, you know, you have literally tens of millions who, who think that Trump won by a landslide and the Democrats have stolen the election. 
Um, you still have members of Congress that say that there's a chance that Trump will actually be inaugurated on January 20th. I mean, it's it's quite it's quite incredible. And we've discussed this as kind of a, a political ploy. Um, it's a it's clearly a delusion. Whether Trump believes it or not, he has surrounded himself by uh, cabinet members and lawmakers who support the, the who feed into the delusion. Um, because yeah, I mean, whether wh whatever he believes in his head, this kind of line of argument has been the precondition for him to save face with his base, but also to to prepare to position himself um, for the next four years to have influence. And you know, we, we've pointed out that Trump can do more damage in um, outside of the Oval Office than than what he can do when he's constrained by all the pressures of the most powerful state apparatus in, in the world. Just imagine what it would mean for him to have nearly the same spotlight, but none of the constraints of, of the presidency. Now he may have overplayed that. You know, He was going to be the, the kind of voice on the sideline, uh, very high profile, very visibly attacking this administration while the country descends into a depression. Um, and now it's, it's really been tarred, so we'll see exactly what it will mean for the next four years, how, how it'll play out. Um, there's also been, you know, this is also coming in the context of growing violence generally that, you know, back to April, if comrades remember, there was a whole series of right-wing um, rallies and demonstrations outside of the state capitals uh, in opposition to the lockdowns. And Trump very openly supported those tweeting, liberate Michigan, liberate uh, Virginia and, and this sort of thing. But there's also, you know, it's this kind of thing has really escalated since the election. There's been um, death threats to lawmakers and election officials. There have been bomb threats. On, on January 6th, there was also a bomb found inside the headquarters of the Republican National Committee um, in DC. In October, there was the FBI uncovered a, a plot to kidnap the governor of Michigan. Um, you know, Mike Pence's house is now surrounded by concrete barricades and chain link fencing. Um, and of course, the, the halls of Congress themselves are being patrolled 24 seven. There's you know, thousands of troops sleeping on every corner and piling their rifles and their helmets on the floors of the, the Capitol. Yesterday, a man was arrested in, in DC for trying to enter the, the militarized downtown area with a false security um, pass and a truck full of ammunition and, and weapons. So, you know, in the context of this, the, the left, as you would expect, has been sounding the alarm of fascism in a very typical way, um, talking about the, the threat of a, of a coup. They've been calling this a coup attempt. And we've responded by talking about the, the balance of forces in society, explaining that January 6th, first of all, was not a coup that the country is not moving towards um, a, military, a military dictatorship, um, that Bonapartism means rule by the sword. You have to have a section of the state, a section of the military um, on board behind a, a, an attempt to seize power. And, and that is not the, the case with Trump at all. In fact, um, in, uh, in, in recent weeks, there, there's been a, a joint letter by every living uh, former defense secretary, all 10 of them, um, basically denouncing Trump's attempt to undermine the integrity of the elections, warning that it represents a threat to the Republic. Um, a couple of days ago, military, the, the highest body of the military, the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff addressed a letter to the whole military, like the, every branch, all 1.3 million uh, members of the armed forces, reminding them of their oath. Uh, reminding them that Joe Biden is going to be the, the, the uh, chief, the, the uh, military, the, the commander of the military um, in a few days, saying that any attempt to intervene in the constitutional process or interfere is against our, is against our traditions, against our oath, against the law. Um, I mean, this, this kind of stuff is really unusual. There was also a statement, uh, another a letter by, or it was, a, it was a statement by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in August, warning that the military was going to play no role in resolving any kind of election dispute. I mean, this it's quite exceptional for the military, which is, which always tries to remain very apolitical to be making these kinds of statements. And I, I think it shows um, the extent of the, the crisis of the institutions, but also it, uh, you know, it shows that Trump has no backing uh, among the military. Aside from the absence of backing, I mean, today, it's still, it's, uh, it's 8.15 on the East Coast in the morning. We'll see what happens. I mean, th this is a big day that they've been predicting 
uh, you know, Trump mobilizations uh, on all the state capitals. We'll see what kind of uh, forces they can turn out. Um, but what we saw in, in DC, I mean, it, there was tens of thousands there. You could see that it, it wasn't just a couple hundred that had rallied around the Capitol, but that wasn't exactly a cross section of the Trump base. You know, it's true that 74 million people voted for Trump, but the ones that were willing to travel from rural parts of the country all over into DC, there were like 68 arrests that night and all but one of them were from out of state. Um, this is like the most fervent types, the most you know, reactionary segments of the Trump base. Um, militia people, far right, you know, including fascist individuals, but also the QAnon conspiracy people, Proud Boy types. I mean, this is that's kind of more the the elements that ended up kind of coming to to DC. But the, the Trump base itself is quite a huge segment of society, and it, and it has different layers to it, and it's now been thrown into a lot of confusion. So we'll see we'll see also the way that this plays out. As for the capitalist class, you know, as I said, they they never saw Trump as a representative. They never wanted him in power. But these events, you know, January 6 was really the last straw. And now they're coming down. They're intervening more directly than ever before. You know, th this election was in that November 3rd saw, you know, the Democrats receiving double the the investment, so to speak, of the that the Republicans had. I mean, the, the bourgeoisie in a very blatant way, you know, the Democrats were the Wall Street candidate. But now um, you have very direct statements from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is like the, you know, the organization, the voice piece of, of the bourgeoisie, the National Association of Manufacturers, which represents 14,000 corporations. Um, basically, you know, the, the, the organs, the political, the, the public uh, relations organs of the Fortune 500 companies, very directly calling on, on Pence to, to, uh, to seriously consider moving in and uh, moving Trump out of the way with the 25th Amendment. It's too late for that. That's not going to happen. Uh, Pence didn't go for it. But now, you know, they're, they're pushing for this, this impeachment thing um, in a very direct way, which is, you know, now they're also saying that they're going to withhold donations, which, as you can imagine, is, is very important uh, by the millions for each of these congressional uh, Republicans that voted to decertify, that voted against the certification of the election. So, very, very direct, um, you know, pressure being applied um, by by the bourgeoisie. McConnell, for his part, um, you know, he's the still the leader of the Senate. The, the impeachment is now going to go to the Senate. So the fact that the House of Representatives has voted for it, the impeachment is a fact. He's been impeached. That means he will be tried. That's that you know, impeachment doesn't necessarily mean removal. It's often used that way, but now it's in the hands of, of the Senate uh, to 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 carry out the trial and either to convict him or, or make its uh, sentence. And it needs two thirds of the Senate in order to impeach him. Obviously it's not about removing him. He will be tried as a former president because you know time is up. But what they're interested in is that, you know if he's impeached, if, if he's convicted, then a simple majority can bar him from ever running again, from ever holding office again. And that's, that's the, uh, the interesting prospect from from the perspective of the Democrats and the Republicans. I mean, you have a full scale civil war in the Republican party. Uh, McConnell wants to purge the party of Trumpism if he can. Um, and so that's that's kind of the, the meaning of the of the impeachment trial at this point. Our position has been to explain that this is, this, this is a, a conflict on the other side of the barricades and to make sure that comments don't fall into supporting the impeachment acts because it's not going to do anything to help the working class. It's not going to do anything to defeat Trumpism. It's like every other uh, attempt that they've made to push Trumpism into a corner, to to cut it off, you know, to deplatform it. All of this stuff um, really doesn't change the the balance of forces, and it doesn't take the fire out of Trumpism. It, it actually, you know, it, it riles up that base even more. There are plenty of other candidates that will step into to fill Trump's shoes. You can have Trumpism without Trump. Um, and it doesn't change the fact that you have this discontent, this kind of uh, loss of legitimacy for the for the election, for the state, for the institutions. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how far this goes, that the changing nature of the Republican Party, which, you know, Trumpism is now claiming to be its own party. It's, it's pushed out the, the bourgeois elements because they now see only one of the two parties as as a as a reliable instrument for their class interest. Now, 
it's yet to be seen what comes of this, uh, you know, how this, this civil war plays out and whether McConnell can actually purge Trumpism from this party. If, if he does so, you know, you have the likelihood of a split and something new emerging, which will be very also, um, you know, a, a very unusual development in, in the political landscape in the US. Um, all in all, I, I found recently uh, a New York Times uh, analysis of these events. You know, the New York Times is kind of the, the main bourgeois press, the, the mouthpiece of the, the United States bourgeoisie, um, trying to make sense of these events. And I just wanted to, to read a little bit of, what, of some of these lines. It says, with less than a week to go, President Trump's term is climaxing in violence and incrimination at a time when the country has fractured deeply and lost a sense of itself. Notions of truth and reality have been atomized. Faith in the system has eroded. Anger is the one common ground. Historians have struggled to define this moment. They compare it with other periods of enormous challenge like the Great Depression, World War II, the Civil War, the McCarthy era, and Watergate. They recall the caning of Charles Sumner on the floor of the Senate and the operation to sneak Abraham Lincoln into Washington for his inauguration for fear of an, of an attack, all of which leaves the United States reputation on the world stage at a low ebb, the shining city upon a hill all scuffed up. The historical moment when we were a model is basically over. So I thought that was quite uh, a dramatic statement of the attitude of the bourgeoisie to what they're watching. It's, a, you know, this is not, I, everyone can understand that this represents the, the decline of, of the global strength of imperialism. I mean, the world can, can see these scenes and say, wow, look at how, look where we've, where we've arrived. You know, it's internally and externally, people understand that we have, we have entered into a, a phase of, of decline. And, you know, for us, this is all in the, in the context of discussing the, the epoch of, of, uh, of revolution. People look at this stuff and I, it's easy to understand now that there are historical forces that are pushing millions of people in the direction of, of revolution. And this is a, you know, a process that had been kind of building beneath the surface for a long time. Uh, last year, in many ways, came out into the surface. The, the, the unprecedented mass movement that we saw uh, with insurrectionary features of its own, with massive support, you know, still more people supported the burning of the police precinct than supported either of these candidates. Um, more eligible voters did not vote than supported either of these candidates, even with record turnout and record votes for, for each of them, because Trump got more votes than any of them, any presidential candidate before, and Biden got even more than that. And you still had more people choose not to vote. Um, the, the economic collapse, of course, the, this shift of the global economy back into a much deeper slump than, than 2008 has been prepared for quite a while, crisis of the regime. Um, in terms of the growing polarization and the violence, there was a 2018 poll that showed that a third of the population predicted civil war by 2023. Uh, and that was, you know, that's a couple, three years ago now. It's, it, it'd be interesting to see what, uh, what the polling indicates on, on, that, uh, on that score now. Um, and this is not, of course, not to mention the, the pandemic, the, the climate crisis, which had a, uh, an incredible year last year with, uh, you know, the Western region in flames. In terms of the, you know, I won't go into the, the, the pandemic a lot. Um, you know, we've all had enough of that topic, but it's still raging out of control. The, the, death, the death toll reached a new daily record recently of 4,400 people which the, the New York Times reported is um, higher than the casualties of any of any US event, you know, more than the, the Battle of Antietam, which was the bloodiest day of the Civil War. Um, and that's kind of the, the reality every day now the, the hospitals are all, you know, over overfilling and so on. In terms of the, the, uh, the economic dislocation, you know, the, the number of people who've had their livelihoods pulled out from underneath them, it's, um, it's definitely every bit as in, in absolute numbers, we're talking about suffering on the scale of the Great Depression um, and, and beyond it. It's enough to recall that before this happened, there were uh, four fifths of the population were living paycheck to paycheck in the US. Um, you know, so you could take that into account when there's all of this, you know, celebration of Biden's plans to pass this new stimulus and give everyone, you know, $1,400 checks um it's 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 really it's really quite meaningless it doesn't it doesn't even begin to address the the uh the impact you know 60 percent of the population has had some kind of a financial impact they say at least one in three workers has had their their pay cut um 
but real unemployment in April hit 23%, which is basically the, the level that we saw in the Great Depression. It's also, you know, it's very, the, 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 the unemployment figures that they give, they stop counting people that, that are not actively looking. So, you know, it's, 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 it's often quite distorted, but if you count, you know, there's, there's other ways to look at the, uh, the, the unemployment. There's an employment population ratio and in April, that hit 51%, which is the lowest um, level since record keeping began in 1948. So in, in terms of people who have stopped looking and are maybe starting to be removed from the workforce, you have like half of the population that's actually working. That's more, I think, an accurate picture of, of the scale of the crisis. 100,000 um, businesses have permanently closed, and there are currently 100, uh, sorry, 10 million fewer jobs than there were in, in March. Um, those are some of the latest figures that I've seen. 1.4 million public sector layoffs, um, you know, which the public sector accounts for about 13% of the, of, of the workforce in the United States. Um, but there's huge budget crises already, budget shortfalls. And I think that's also kind of a, a preview of the, of the austerity that's gonna come in the way that, that this will uh, continue to, to play out. Trump's approval rating is at its lowest ever. It's fallen even since August. I mean, it's, it was kind of quite incredible to see that during most of the pandemic, his base didn't blame him and saw him as the, the one that could defend the economy and jobs and saw Biden as like the one pushing for lockdown and was going to threaten the, the Rust Belt, but also threaten the, you know, uh, the, the, the economy. And so that, that was kind of a basic split is that people, voters that were more concerned about the pandemic tended to support Biden. Voters that were more support, uh, concerned about the economy tended to support Trump. Well, even since August, there's been a sharp decline in his jobs um, approval, his jobs rating, like his uh, performance with the economy. Um, and even among Republicans, there were 77% that approved of his jobs performance in August. Now it's down to 60%, which is quite a, quite a, a, a decline. Um, during most of his four years, his ratings never really dipped below 36%. It was usually between 36, 45, and now it's down to 29%. So that's basically where, he, where he's going to leave office. Um, and you know, as for the, the stimulus measures, the, the two, I guess the third one is now um, underway. Two have been passed last year. It amounted to 4 trillion um, and not including the latest measure, which is, which is you know, in, in the works now of 1.5, nine trillion more um but you know in the past only a fifth of that was spent on on payments to individuals you know there was a lot again it was there, a lot was made in the media of people receiving these checks in the mail but four fifths of it went to bail out corporations some of it went to plug budget um shortfalls but you know huge bailouts i mean the largest in history more more was spent than the 18-year invasion of afghanistan in just the 2020 bailouts and the companies had no strings attached, no, no need to maintain their payroll. Um, they were able to carry out massive layoffs and then also be receiving tens of millions in, in bonuses. I mean, that's the way that this has, has played out. Um, going back to also the, you know, another important element that we saw this spring was, you know, with the rise of the pandemic and everything, uh, a, a strike wave that has, I think, been overshadowed largely in the in the media, and it was not just you know um, grocery store workers and fast food workers. It, it tends to have like an image that this was a, a movement of a layer of service sector workers, but there really was an industrial wildcat strike uh, wave of of workers and processing plants in Georgia, Minnesota, meat packing plants in Nebraska, Colorado, fruit packing workers on the West Coast, uh, bus drivers in in Michigan, in Alabama. Uh, strikes at General Electric, Fiat, Chrysler in Michigan. Uh, there was a strike among these those auto workers because it wasn't hot water uh, for washing their hands. I mean, some of these stories that are kind of like you think of, uh, you know, those moments where a strike can erupt from you know a situation 60, 80 years ago. That's kind of the the scenes that you're seeing now. Sanitation workers in in New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, also in Pittsburgh. Um, lots of strikes by healthcare workers. 800. Uh, nurses that went on strike at Chicago University Hospital, uh, 400 nurses in Connecticut, uh, not to mention the hundreds of actions in the service sector. Also tuition strikes, uh, rent strikes, hasn't had a massive organization, but 
you know, the, the point is that we saw a genuine strike wave, something that we haven't seen in a long time in the United States that involved the heavy battalions of, of the working class. And it's another example of something that could have escalated dramatically if it had been given a lead. You know, you, you're basically seeing a movement of the young layer of the working class that has, you know, it's replenished the ranks of, of, the, of the workers since 2008. It's this generation that has lived through this ongoing consequences of a very, uh, the anemic recovery, no improvement in the, in the job market. You still have, you know, it's these low wage, the uh, $15 an hour type of jobs are now, you know, the, the, the main thing that this generation um, can hope to find. And it's changing the outlook of the working class. You know, having that layer is now the, the largest cohort in the in society and in, in the working class. It means that you now have these kinds of mood, this discontent, this growing class consciousness among uh, broad layers of, of workers who are who are younger. There's also you know indicators like in the private sector, it's only six percent of the workforce that's unionized, but um, among 18 to 34 year olds, 71 percent support unions. Um, around half, uh, according to a poll from a couple of years ago, of the of the entire workforce, half said that they would like to join a union if given the opportunity. So there is clearly a, a huge potential for an explosion in the in the labor movement in the years ahead. And of course, it's being held back by the conservative labor leaders who don't who don't tap into it, who don't give it a lead. Um, it's just being kind of held back. Uh, of course, the, the largest, the most important event uh, and the, the most important learning experience from last year, I think, was definitely the mass movement against police terror. It was the, the largest that we've seen in the history of the United States. Um, you know, we were, we were discussing in, uh, in the spring uh, a report that the Pentagon was reviewing its civil disturbance operations, that they were in the, in the context of mass movements around the world and you know, the expectation that there was going to be a lot of unrest, they were preparing for these kinds of things. And practically, we had that, you know, that very situation uh, facing us very shortly thereafter of uh, a movement that reached every single city in the, the country. There was 2,500 cities impacted. And, you know, I mean, again, these scenes of the president cowering underground um, in a bunker, we all know that 10% of the population came out into the streets, some 26 million people, but it was also the the millions more, the tens of millions who supported it, um, you know, from from their homes. So the 54% that supported the burning the the precinct, but over 70% across the board that supported the movement as a whole. I mean, that's that's really I think a better indication of the balance of forces and where the mood of the masses is at, particularly the youth. I mean, the, those the millions that were out there were primarily this layer of the of the working class, the young people that are. That, that represent the future of, of the class struggle. And of course, very quickly afterwards, the liberals that tried that tried to like co-opt the movement have now are now acting like it never happened. If they've, they've stopped talking about it, there's no force in Congress or in the Democratic Party that that you know wants to speak to this to this mass movement or or put itself forward as a as a representative of, of that layer of society. The embryonic examples of these defense committees popping up spontaneously in, in working class neighborhoods, if that had been given a lead, if that had been fostered, coordinated nationally, I mean, very quickly that, that could have led to a, a dual power type of situation because you have people making decisions about what, you know, defying curfew and defying the local law enforcement, you're talking about another force rivaling the state. Um, clearly there were a lot of very uh, very important implications that, that could have developed, um, but they didn't. There, there's a crisis of leadership, and I guess that's the that's the bottom line of, of what we're seeing. That's kind of a, a theme uh, around the world: is that you see this potential, but it's not given a lead um, in the absence of of the forces of Marxism being strong enough to do it. Um, another indi indicator of the mood in society is, you know, it's, it's like the the New York Times quote that uh, anger is the common denominator. And that's that's definitely confirmed in the in the polls. There was one from this summer that says uh, this is Pew Research. It's it's uh, it was it's its findings were published under the title "The Public's Mood Turns Grim," and it says about seven in ten Americans, seventy one percent, say they feel angry about the state of the country these days. Nine in ten uh, now say they are dissatisfied with the way things are going. Uh, so it's, you know, this is a mood that we've seen since 2006, uh, since 2016, but it's definitely 
you know, it's, it's accelerating, it's intensifying, you know, when, when with the rise of the Sanders campaign in 2016, we, we could basically say people are rejecting capitalism, but their sense of what socialism means is quite vague. And, you know, the, for a lot of people, it's still very much uh, illusions in reforming the system and, and making it, giving it a, a nicer smiling face. But there was this, you know, the, the, there was a business insider headline this summer that said only 25% of Americans think capitalism in its current form is benefiting society. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that think capitalism could be given a different form, but there was 20% of respondents that said no form of capitalism can produce the kind of future we want for the next generation. And if they're rejecting all forms of capitalism and that's 20% of the population, you know, that for us, that's like, that's very interesting development. You know, that's a, a revolutionary stance practically. Um, so we've seen a lot of these polls that uh, that are, are are showing this kind of mood. Another one, uh, Pew's Pew research about Americans changing views on why people are rich. It says a growing share of respondents said the main reason people were rich was because they had more advantages than others. You know, rather than saying attributing it to their their efforts or their work or whatever. From 2018 to 2020, the figure rose from 42 percent who responded that way to 65 percent. So again, there's this. That's quite a dramatic shift to people that say the rich are rich because the system is their system. It benefits them. It's just, you know, they don't buy into the, the kind of classic story of, uh, you know, that explains capitalist inequality. And all of this is the background to what we've seen over the last four years. I think that, you know, 2020 is, has been a, a confirmation of the trend from 2016 where the moderate center collapsed, uh, the status quo was the main enemy and people were fed up with it. And, you know, on the one hand, that, that polarization was expressed with two polls, with Trump and with, uh, and with Sanders. And in 2020, we had the, a serious possibility for that, for this election to play out the same way in the sense that Sanders could have had immense momentum. You know, if Sanders, of course, had broken, which was what would have changed everything to, to take a class independent course and take those forces and put them outside of the Democratic Party. Um, Again, the you know we, we can only speculate about how, how things could have played out, but what's clear is that he had more momentum than any other Democratic candidate for the the presidential nomination, um, and you know there were more uh, candidates than ever. There was like a dozen, uh, eleven candidates that, that were running in the Democratic primaries this year. Everyone hoping that you know they could ride the anti-Trump wave, but in all four of the first. Uh, races, Sanders, Sanders won. Some of them were a little bit close, um, but Sanders, Sanders beat uh, Buttigieg in Iowa in terms of votes. They, they ended up having the same tying for delegates. In New Hampshire, Sanders won, and uh, he also won among all voters under the age of 44. He beat Buttigieg by 12 percentage points, and uh, among voters under the age of 29, he won by three to one. So huge uh, youth preference for, for Sanders. Next was Nevada, um, and again Sanders won by a landslide. There, he, you know, this is after, uh, you know, there was all kinds of media inter interference trying to pit the, the 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 unions against him and so on over the health care bill. In the end, he he beat Biden by by two to one. Biden came in fourth in Iowa, fifth in New Hampshire, uh, without even enough votes to win a single convention delegate. I mean, so that's the that's the picture at the beginning of the Democratic primary. Sanders had huge momentum. Biden was increasingly considered a lost cause. People thought he wasn't going to go anywhere. Um, and that's when all this, you know, the media was attacking Sanders, you know, the, the CNN hosts were asking, can anyone stop? Can, it, can are we going to be able to stop coronavirus or Bernie Sanders? Like this was the, the two big threats um, at the time. And then finally, Biden won one race in South Carolina and six other candidates immediately folded their campaigns and got in line be, to endorse Biden. So, I mean, it was really an unprecedented maneuver and it was perceived that way. Um, but whereas Sanders won 13 million votes in 2016, he folded up his campaign quite early, also in the context of the pandemic and everything. He still won 10 million votes this time. There's no telling how many he, he might have won if he had kept in the in the race, but uh, he folded it up in, in April. And that was basically the end. That, that betrayal hit people very hard, uh, people who expected him to to, uh, to push through. I mean, they saw it as a repeat of the 2016 capitulation. This was like the, the 2.0. And that for us, that was the beginning of what we called the Bernie bump in terms of a, a sustained influx of contacts that 
really has turned into a, a steady stream. It's, you know, at first it was like a fire hose. I mean, we're getting, you know, hundreds of people writing us uh, each week. And now it's still, it's kind of more of a trickle, but it's been kind of this, this flow. So I think that's quite significant. People saw that as an avenue that has been closed off and it's really pushed people to say, all right, well, we got to try something else. Clearly this has not worked. Um, uh, running a bit out of time here, but just to, just to say that there was a big turnout in the, in, among the youth for these elections. 53% uh, of 18 to 29 year olds voted. It was 43% in 2016. Um, and it was overwhelmingly voting not for Biden, but against Trump. I think that, that all that much was very clear in the, in the exit polls. Most expensive election in history, 14 billion was spent. It was more than the last two election cycles combined. Democrats outspent Republicans two to one. Um, and it was massive donations on the whole. It was, you know, small donations accounted for a very small portion of the finances. Um, and Trump's base didn't abandon him. I mean, that's the, you know, the, the and, and the reason for that, I think we have to understand that social polarization is this, the anger that's beneath the surface, the, the desire to reject the status quo. What has been offered as the alternative to Trumpism? More status quo, uh, the party of Wall Street, all the, the forces of the media attacking Trumpism, all of that has just served to push Trump's base more into that corner. And, you know, our response has been to say this, this polarization, it's reactionary. Yeah, the, the working class is split. There's, there are millions of workers who are supporting Trumpism that should be supporting a mass working class party. And if there were a class alternative that were attacking the status quo, the problem is that the left has really softened and adapted to to the establishment. I mean, the, the squad and AOC and the, these uh, DSA self-described socialists, they don't talk like socialists. They don't attack the status quo. They don't attack Nancy Pelosi. They all had the opportunity to, you know, there was a small margin that gave Nancy Pelosi the position of speaker at the head, you know, that, that leadership position in the House of Representatives. And they required all of the votes of the squad in order for her to be, be to win that, that position. There was, a, there was a lot of voices on the left and among DSA saying we should withhold those votes unless she, you know, puts uh, Medicare for all to the vote. There was kind of this like saying we have one moment where we have a little bit of leverage and none of them did it. You know, the, it the AOC's response was, well, that's not really realistic. We have to focus on things that are realistic. I mean, there's been quite a lot of, of disappointment, I think, in this whole strategy that DSA has pursued of running uh, socialist candidates on the Democratic Party line, only to see them capitulate one after another and be basically indistinguishable from from the rest of the of that party. And that's really what has happened: is that they all they all appear. I mean, there's there's no distinction. Now the the Democrats are coming to power with the trifecta. They have the White House. They have a majority in the Senate and in the House of Representatives. They're gonna they're gonna have no excuses for not passing anything that they want to pass. And they're going to preside over a horrible depression and everyone's life is going to get a lot worse and Trumpism is going to be inflamed. And so this is basically the, uh, that's basically the situation that we have in the, the, the coming years. There are divisions, again, in the, the coalition that forms the, the base of Trump. And our role is to say the socialist movement cannot be associated with the party of Wall Street. You know, I think now more than ever, we have fertile ground for making a case for class independence. Um, and for helping people, to, people to, to, to understand what it would mean for the socialist movement to run its candidates independently of the Democrats, to find, you know, uh, you know races in the, in the uh, major cities, for DSA to mobilize its tens of thousands of members um, to make a case that we need a, a party of the working class. And I think it would end up having a, a huge echo. Um, but in the meantime, it's, it's basically a, a discussion of strategy of trying to appeal to people who identify as socialists to draw the lessons of this failed balance sheet that has brought us to this point, explain how, how to fight Trumpism, how not to fight Trumpism. And, and in the meantime, I think that there's very clearly a large layer that's, uh, that's moving in our direction. There's a, a layer of young people that are searching for revolutionary socialism 